Good morning. Nice to see you. Whether it's your first time or you've been here since longer than you can remember or you've just been coming a couple of times, don't, uh, doesn't make any difference. Welcome. It's good to see you. And uh, We're just going to pray. Father, we pray that you would help us to hear from you today. Oh, Lord, help us to, to know your presence with us as we meet with each other. Bless you, Lord, that we can. You are the God who made heaven and earth. You are the Lord of all. And we want to bring all our praise to you. Amen. Yes, amen, Kezia. Let's stand and sing. chance that we have to praise you, to honour you, to give you glory. But we thank you, Lord, most of all for that love that you have for us in sending Jesus, your Son, to live among us, die for us, and rise to new life. We give you our praise, but we thank you for your love.
Joy's going to come and read to us. The reading is from Isaiah, chapter 61, the first nine verses. The Sovereign Lord has filled me with his spirit. He has chosen me and sent me to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to announce release to captives and freedom to those in prison. He has sent me to proclaim that the time has come when the Lord will save his people and defeat their enemies. He has sent me to comfort all who mourn, to give to those who mourn in Zion joy and gladness instead of grief, a song of praise instead of sorrow. They will be like trees that the Lord himself has planted. They will do what is right and God will be praised for what he has done. They will rebuild cities that have long been in ruins. My people, foreigners will serve you they will take care of your flocks and farm your land and tend your vineyards. And you will be known as the priests of the Lord, the servants of our God. You will enjoy the wealth of the nations and be proud that it is yours. Your shame and disgrace are ended and you will live in your own land and your wealth will be doubled. Your joy will last forever. The Lord says... I love justice and I hate oppression and crime. I will faithfully reward my people and make an eternal covenant with, with them. They will be famous amongst the nations and everyone who, who sees them will know that they are a people whom I have blessed. Going to, Joy will be back uh, later on in the service just sharing a personal, some personal thoughts about the ark. But I've asked Dave and Pam if they'd come up and I'm going to ask them some questions. It may cause a commotion because Kezia sees drama particularly up top, but I'm not worried, so you're not worried either. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to take that? 
Yeah, I was right, I bite. Yeah, that's okay. Yes, it's very exciting, isn't it, Kezia? Pam, I was going to ask, and I, and I am going to ask, what was the biggest achievement of the ark been so far? But what's, what's the biggest thing? What's the thing you want us to tell us about that, that you feel the ark has achieved? Uh, when I was... I was kind of thinking about this when I went out for a run Friday morning and I was listening to, somebody had reminded me of Simon and Guy Funkel. Yep. So I was running along listening to some of those tunes from my childhood. And what really struck me, and I can't remember which one of those, it's one of their well-knowns, it said about, I'm just a poor boy and my story's rarely told. Yes. And that really spoke to me because God's really been speaking about the poor for me. And I guess the ark story, the ark story is that traditional one of feeding lots of people. Um, but I suppose for me, there's a lot more than that. It's the ones and twos. It's the ones and twos that we've made a huge difference to. It was the mum that the other day told me that um, her partner had left her and that she was able to get through this because we'd done some kind of support with her. It's the ones that message me and say, I'm really sorry I can't volunteer anymore because I've been able to get myself a full-time job. It's the ones that say, I can't do this because you've encouraged me to do that. It's the ones and twos, and that for me is, I know that we feed 300 a, a week, but you know what? I was that one that God sought out, and for me, it's the ones and twos that just make a difference. Good, good. Dave's in the background much more. He, he, he's got a job. He can't come and volunteer, can he? Um, but you do a lot of stuff in the background um, and seem to get grants out of just about anybody. Um, what's, been, what's, been the hard, I've gone dead. what's been the hardest thing to organise? Um, in terms of organisation, I, I, to be honest, I, I think the challenge for me is that it's quite enjoyable, so the challenge is probably the wrong word, but looking out for the grants, applying for the grants is okay, it's great, we've got lots of funders and that's fantastic. I think the most frustrating thing has been a bit like we had Messy Church yesterday, it was all a bit chaotic, but it was great. Um, it's the chaos which can be organised on a Monday night um, because we haven't got storage and, and recognising we need and we're very grateful to the church for allowing us to use premises, but recognising the need for that extra storage and that, that planning permission going through is a massive, massive relief. Um, because, where's Adrian? I'm not going to blame the council, but... Um, no, I mean, seriously, it, it, it's... You, you can employ consultants to do this sort of stuff, you do it yourself. I had to hand-draw lots of documents, and I, I can't draw anyway, so... That was amusing, um, showing sizes, dimensions, and whatever, and trying to justify to the local authority why this was essential. And if you look at various policy documents, unfortunately, in 21st century Britain, it is policy for people that can't afford to survive to use food banks, which I think is really sad. So if we hadn't got that, the reality is that in, well, by January 25 originally, the existing storage would have been ripped out. Now, the idea that this is going to go away overnight is just... It's just nonsense, and who knows where we're going to go. But I think that, that to me, was the biggest challenge. All the other stuff in the background keeps me busy, um, but is enjoyably busy, that makes sense. Good. So, Pam, you're much, you're much more... Um, that was me, because I've just put new batteries in. Um, you're much more hands-on, in a sense. There. What's the biggest challenge going forward that you see for us, see, Eric? So there's, there's multiple challenges, really, I guess. I mean, practical challenges are getting enough food. Um, I was laying on a sunbed last September when I got a text message saying, please don't pray for food when you're not here to receive it because you're just not funny, Mum. Um, because there's been weeks when I've shut the lock up and I've thought, I don't know what we're going to do, but we're gonna, God's going to have to do something big. Yeah. I don't know what the biggest challenges are. I think for me... I sometimes feel like I can't really get alongside people because I'm so busy yeah. doing the 
and rightly so, organising the food and organising... And I've got lots of volunteers that help me, but there's lots of things that I think, right, OK, I'll do that, I'll do that, I'll do that. And actually, for me, I'd, I'm that person that would rather sit and chat with somebody. I'm more than happy to be a workhorse and do lots of work. But sometimes I just think, I just don't have time to talk to this person. And yeah. that, for me, is really sad. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the biggest challenges. I mean, obviously, storage. Um, uh, possibly the, the, uh, the trustees might say I'm one of the biggest challenges because <laughs> I'll just go, oh, we're we going to do this. And I can see them all go, great, here we go. Um, so, yeah, that might be a challenge. But, yeah, and, I mean, the kitchen is challenging at times. The oven is challenging. challenging. You yeah. know, that kind of thing. The equipment is challenging, but... Yeah, I'll go home on a Tuesday exhausted and think, yeah, right then. Yeah, yeah, good. So I don't good. know if that's answered it. That's, but. No, that's good. <laughs> so, Dave, I'll ask you this. How, uh, <sighs> there are people who can't come on a Tuesday. Like, you come when you can, but, you know, you've got a job. Uh, and there are people who've got jobs, or there are people who've got other things on. How can people help who can't actually be here when people are coming and getting help? How can people help? Otherwise, so I suppose, I suppose the obvious answer is pray, and I know a lot of you do pray already. So th thank you for your prayer. If you want to be, I'm not going to tell you what to pray for. You know, there's lots of things that go on here. Lots of people need help. Um, lots of people come here that, yeah, food might be the obvious thing, but actually there's lots of underlying things. So, you know, the people that come on a Tuesday might be able to guide you more on that. But I would encourage you, if you can, um, read Matthew 25, parable of sheep and goats. And that might challenge you, and that might, you know, might open up some things that you want to pray for, or prompt you. You know, it's about feeding people. It's about recognising their need and, and, and working with them to help them through that need. You know, and Jesus says, "What we do for those people, you're doing for Him." So I'd, I'd encourage you to look at that. I, I think financially, yeah. I mean, if you want to donate, fantastic. You know, and I'm happy to provide you with details. I was trying to do some maths this morning on the way in because we we spend about two thousand pounds a month. On, on food and stuff. Yeah, so it's £24,000 a year. It sounds like a massive amount of money, and it is for a church our size. size. But the reality is, God's provided. Mm. You know, mm. um, so Whether it's through grants, or whether it's people here that have already been very generous, um, we're always going to say, yes, we, we could do with more, because we, we could. The cost of living not only affects the people that we're serving, but it costs us more to buy stuff as well. So... It is tricky, but I was trying to do this maths, and I, I was thinking that, well, if, if everyone sort of gave round numbers, Mark, sorry, but everyone gave sort of a pound a week, you know, I was thinking that 40 members, what that would look like, that would be quite transformational, actually. Now, I know not everyone can, so I'm not, I'm not asking for that, but please, just, just bear it in mind. And I know Dave says that he's not going to tell people how to pray, Pam, but if there was one thing or two things that we could pray for, what would it be? I guess that everyone that comes through the building in whatever way gets to meet God and know him the way that we do because otherwise it's all been wasted. Yeah. It hasn't been wasted because we've done what God has asked us. We've yeah. fed the poor. Yeah. Um, and we know that obviously some folks can't do that physically but they've enabled that or they've prayed for that. But yeah, I think that the people that come through here and that's one of the things that one of the mums the other day said to me, oh, sometimes I don't take... And I said, are you OK? Did you not get much of your food today? And she went, I didn't need it. I just like the fact that people talk to me like I'm a person. <laughs> that, yeah. yeah. So, you know, so that people know just how God sees them. Because that poor boy, yeah, for me, that poor boy's story isn't told of how that woman felt. And she, you know, I looked and she had, I think I, I saw her on the tins, she brought one tin for 10p. Not because she didn't have any money, because she liked talking to people. Yeah. It was the only time that, that week. Yeah. 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 Pray for those people, those ones and twos, those ones that Jesus would hang out at the well for. Yeah, absolutely. And we see lines of them outside. Yeah, absolutely. And pray for the trustees as well. They, they lead and guide everything. And just pray for strength and wisdom. But yeah, yeah, we're just, yeah, I'm just blown away by being allowed to see this work and what God's doing in this community. Yeah. And particularly, we saw Messy Church yesterday, 
and I was really touched because I couldn't be there. And what was really special was everybody had a link with the Ark. And that, to me, was immense. Yeah. You know, no longer is God not in this part of Shubri. He was always in this part of Shubri, but we really people struggled. See him. People see him. Though. Yeah. Yeah, we've been really blessed. So. Good. Thank you. The song we're about to sing talks about our broken world. But the question that's asked is, is he worthy? Let's sing. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. It's great. And is all creation groaning? Is a new creation coming? Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is, is it good that we remind ourselves of this?
Shall we pray? And uh, just to give you some context, I've taken some of the um, prayer requests from the back, so I'll be running through those as well. This morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, that we can come and worship freely this morning. Thank you, Lord, for how you bless each and every one of us in this church and how you, how you developed the activities of this church in the recent past, Lord. We thank you for Messy Church yesterday. We thank you for those that came and had a good time, had a fun time, learned a little bit more about you, but more than anything, Lord, we thank you for the church being the focal point of the community and the relationships that develop from there. Lord, we thank you for the ark and the fact that we can meet people's practical needs, Lord, but through that, build those relationships. And for all that that's formed, Lord, from people coming into brigades, coffee morning, Lord, we just praise you, and cameo as well, Lord. And we thank you for those that faithfully run those activities. Lord, for other folk in the church this morning, I know I need the touch of prayer. And Lord, some of those that have been specially requested, Lord, we, we continue to pray for Ron and Heather, particularly with Heather's health, and, and as they start their, their married life together. Lord, we pray for Linda's grandson, Rob, and uh, the diagnosis with a second bout of cancer there. So, Lord, we thank you that it hasn't spread, and thank you for your healing power. We pray for Claire's family and, and, and Uncle John following the loss of his mum. We pray for Emily, who's been left on her own with two small children, and she would like prayer. So, Lord, we just pray that you'll, you'll come for her and provide her with the support needed and those around her that can help. And we pray for Tina, Lord, that had a fall. Um, for healing. Lord, we pray for the world situation. We think of Sudan at the moment and uh, the warring factions there, Lord, and just pray that uh, somehow, Lord, that you can intervene in, in that situation. We're just men seeking more power. One army bigger than the other army, stronger than the other army, Lord. And now that's tearing apart that country. And we thank you for the aid agencies that are out there trying to trying to work in those circumstances. And for those in the rest of the world, Lord, that are helping people with their direct needs, and those Christians, Lord, across the world, Lord, that uh, are working to show your love to others, often in dire circumstances that we can, we can only imagine. So that we pray for them. And Lord, this morning we pray for our local EBA region church up in Sudbury and Suffolk, and uh, thank you for the work that Mark Lenowski is doing there alongside his leadership team. And thank you, Lord, that, uh, that they're spreading relationships, as it says here, as a net throughout the town and local area. And a strong sense of responsibility they have to witness to the community. So we pray for them. And pray for the way they've supported the Ukrainian families as well at this time. So, Lord, I just close in prayer by asking that for each person here, Lord, that you'll stir something in them, Lord, as a result of today's service, through what they hear from the front, whether it's through Duncan, Joy, anyone else, that they may go out changed, ready to do work for you. Amen. Preaching, Duncan. No, no, no. <laughs> Don't do that to me, please. Um, just some thoughts, really. Um, at the beginning of this year, um, the ARC was awarded um, some funding specifically for young families with children under 12 years of age. And that meant we were able to bless some of our families with something extra. And she has a great joy in giving and seeing the look on some of these faces. And I really enjoyed working with some of these mums, mainly mums that, that came. And what it meant was on a Tuesday, we had to identify um, some of these families that would benefit from this extra gift. And Pam would wave sometimes and just say, perhaps this one. And, um, but generally, it was looking around to see who regularly came to the ark um, that we could bless. Um, 
Once identified, it was a case of trying to find a quiet spot on a Tuesday afternoon. Sometimes there's children with, with the parents. In fact, quite often there's a lot of children with parents. So it's trying to find a, a quiet place where you could actually just put this gift to them and decide whether or not it was something they wanted to, to be part of. Um, it was good because it was face to face and like Pam said, quite often it's so busy, we don't actually get to get alongside people and chat to them. But face to face, it was brilliant because um, some were overwhelmed with the offer um, and tears were shed. For others, it was, well, I think we're okay at the moment, thank you, but thanks for asking us, you know, let somebody else have that gift. And then for others, it was an opportunity for them to tell their story. And I'm not going to tell you any of their stories, but it does make me realise that we... We want to serve this community. We, we say we serve this community, but actually this community is made up of individuals with individual needs. And we need to see them as individuals and act appropriately. And I felt quite privileged that some of these people could actually tell me what was going on in their lives. And there was opportunity to actually signpost them to some of the other agencies that we work with. Um, so we've done something and it's so sad that actually, you know, you can see people in the queue actually um, chatting and smiling, but when you get them on their own, they're broken. And some of them are almost on their knees. And I'd like to think that the ARC does a little bit to help them stand um, and make a difference. And This is our Thanksgiving service because we want to say thank you to God for all he has done. That he's a God who gives generously and that he's a God who continues to keep on giving. And my prayer for the Ark is that through our contact with people, with talking with people, getting alongside them, that we will actually lead them to Christ. Um, because problems don't go away. But he guides us through these situations. So thank you for your support. If you haven't been into the ARC at any point, pop in. You don't have to volunteer, but just come and see what's going on. This church is full on a Tuesday afternoon. And um, we love it. Yes, we're tired, but we love it. And that's all thanks to God. Thank you, Joy. Marty's going to come and uh, read to us from the book of James. Thanks, Marty. This reading is from James 2, verses 1 to 19. My brothers and sisters... Believers in our glorious Lord, Jesus Christ, must not show favouritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to a man wearing fine clothes, and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated, um, discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he has promised um, those who love him? But you have dishonoured the poor. It is not the rich who are exploiting you. Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming in a noble name of him whom you belong. If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbour as yourself, you are doing right. 
But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anybody who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother and sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith about deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even in demons, we believe that. Even in demons, believe that, and shudder. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our rock and our redeemer. It's the local elections this week. Um, this place will be used for something completely different. Um, and if you vote locally, then you're likely to be in here again on Thursday. Don't forget your ID. You need one now. So politicians are pushing leaflets through our doors. They're putting stuff on television. They're making grand promises about grand things that they will do immediately if we get them back in. And of all the terrible things that the, uh, the people who are not in their party will do, uh, the world will come to an end. But politicians do that, don't they? I'm just going to read you a bit of a speech of a politician. In this hour, I would ask of the Lord God only this, that he would give his blessing to our work, and that he may even give us the courage to do the right. I am convinced that men who are created by God should live in accordance with the will of the Almighty. No man can fashion world history unless upon his purpose and his powers there rests the blessing of this providence. And I can imagine... Uh, well, particularly perhaps Christians hearing that and thinking, what a great speech. Except, it was part of a speech by the Chancellor of Germany in 1937, Adolf Hitler. And it didn't take very long for the world to see that what he said and what he was doing were two completely different things. But it's easy to berate politicians. It's easy to tell others that, oh, they're terrible. And they're terrible because of this, and they're terrible because of that. But you know what? James isn't talking to politicians. He's talking to you, and he's talking to me. We can't do a lot about the politicians. Well, we can. I suppose we can vote. But apart from that, there's not much we can do. But we can do a lot about ourselves. And in that, uh, admittedly, sorry, Matty, very long reading that I gave you uh, to read, um, it begins with this sense that the early church was just full of people like, like you and I. And James imagines a scenario when, where someone comes in who's obviously quite wealthy, who's obviously quite well off, who's obviously um, pro probably well known in the area and... Um, could do good things for the church, comes in and gets shown to the front, although in Baptist circles, obviously, the back seats are the best seats, aren't they? Um, but um, gets shown to the good seats, and, uh, and then someone comes in, well, at least a bit scruffy, if not a bit smelly, 
And to this man, the congregation or the person says, oh, sit at my feet if you want. Or sit over there. And he's talking about discrimination. Not discrimination due to race or gender or anything else, but discrimination due to wealth and poverty. Favoritism. And he says, you've become judges with evil thoughts if you do that sort of thing. If you judge people on the way they look or on how much money they have or on what they can do for you, you've dishonored yourself and you're dishonoring them. And then he brings in the argument, isn't it not the rich who actually cause the problems of the world? Is it not the rich who are opposing you? Is it not the rich who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? It's the rich that don't like the church. Those who are well enough off, perhaps just to ignore, think that their problems can be solved by the latest foreign holiday or the newest sports car or gadget. It's the rich. He says, don't you dare. Don't you dare discriminate against against those who have nothing. Because if we do... We miss the mind of God because he says, has not God chosen the poor of this world to transform it? Oh, he has. He's transformed and he transforms through the poor of this world. You might look at me being a Baptist minister. Now, you don't imagine I'm posh, although some people in Shubriness did say to me, I live in a posh area because I live in the painter's estate. And apparently that's posh. Um, um, but I grew up uh, on a council estate in a small place in Northern Ireland um, across the road from a primary school in a place where everybody knew everyone else but times at time were tough and God has been good to me There have been other times when I've seen the reality of what it means to have no money and to wonder where life is going in my own life and in the lives of others. And if our hearts don't break for those who have nothing and feel they are nothing, then we are not in touch with what God is thinking and what God is saying. The rich and the poor. He says, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. Oh, what a wonderful thing to call it. I mean, this royal law um, comes from the Old Testament. Jesus quotes it when asked, what are the greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And it brought up the greatest parable, I think, of all, when someone says, who is my neighbor? And he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. This is the law that he wants us to keep. These are the rules that he longs for us to hold on to and to act on. What do you think when you think of the law of God? What do you think of? What's the first thing that comes into your head? Perhaps I'm unfair, but perhaps it's all the laws that other people should keep. And you wish they did. All the things, maybe our church, maybe our community, maybe our country, maybe our world would be a better place if people just did this or just did that. But he says, James says to us, keep this royal law. Love your neighbor as yourself. Our world would be a much better place if we just did that. But you see, the trouble is, we can't do that by ourselves. We can't do it on our own. And that's why when Jesus quotes what, in, in answer to the question, what's the greatest commandment, he begins with love for God, and he ends with love for neighbor. And actually, that's the point that James get to, gets to towards the end of that very long reading. 
because he tells us to act as if we are those who are to be judged by God. And he talks about faith. He talks about the faith, the trust that we need to have in God, the trust that we need to have in God to change our lives and to transform us and to help us to be the people that God wants us to be. But it begins with an internal transformation. And that's what we had, we had read from us, for us um, from Isaiah. But again, Jesus quotes that in the New Testament. And what does he say? The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to give freedom to the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so I need to say to you, you are in God's favor. Oh, you might have done things that he doesn't like. You might have done things that you, know you don't like. But you are in God's favor, and he longs for that relationship with you that we were all made for. And it comes when we put our faith and put our trust in him. It doesn't begin with trying to put things right, trying to make up for, for the things we've done. It begins with finding forgiveness in him and saying to him, now, do something with that, Lord. And do you know what he does? He takes on the challenge. When we come to him and say to him, I put my trust in you, will you forgive me? For the, I don't even want to talk about the things I've done. Will you forgive me and help me to be different? He sends his spirit and begins to work in our lives. Oh, he begins to work. Sometimes it takes a long time. It's over 50 years since I gave my trust to him and started to follow him, and he's still working at it. But it begins with putting our trust in him and what he did on the cross as some of the songs have spoken about that we might be forgiven he paid the price that we might be forgiven I know we, we want to put things right ourselves we want to, to try and, and make things right but we can't, we need to trust him my challenge to you today is have you even thought about it Oh, there's all kinds of things you could say, like, I'm no good, I'm going to be no use to him. Believe me, he's taken many people who thought that and made great things out of them. You can start today. But for you, for you, for you, I'm going back to my normal man stuff, but for you who have already put your trust in him, who've started walking with him, have said, Lord, forgive me, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know where I'm going, I don't know what's happening, but show me. For you, it begins with doing the things he calls us to do. And one of the things he calls us to do here in James is to love our neighbors and to care for other people. And he says, what good is faith that says when someone has no clothes to wear, no food to eat, nowhere to live perhaps, what good is it to say, the Lord bless you, <laughs> be warm, be well fed, as they walk off? You know what we do on a Tuesday is done because that's what God told us to do as a church. That's why, that's why it began. I know that a certain someone has been praying for years that something this might happen and had the vision of New Pam. But God sent us someone, a social worker, put us in charge of some, in touch with some other people. And we just started thinking it'll run for about six weeks. God has led us on from there. God has led us on to work as a church, to work with people who come from other churches, with people who come from the community, and to meet the needs of people in the way that James tells us we should. And I am so heartened, I was very heartened by what Joy had to say and what Pam had to say about those individuals. Because that's what it's about. God doesn't see crowds. God sees you. God sees me as individuals. And he loves you and he loves me. Certainly beyond what I deserve. And what the scriptures tell us beyond what any of us deserve. But if we're followers of him, and if we've asked him for his forgiveness and told him that we'll take his hand and walk with him through whatever life throws at us, 
then he calls us to show our faith by what we do. James says, some will say, you have faith, I have deeds. He says, show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith through my deeds, by my deeds. That's what God has called us to do as a church and that's why we're doing it. And to God will be the glory. God will work in people's hearts. You know, God is working in people's hearts even though they may not know it. Those who come, even though perhaps they don't have so much need of food, but come because, and I've heard it myself, people say, they've said it to me directly, they've said, when you come here, people treat you like a human being. When you come here, people smile. And I know what some of the volunteers are going through. I know how life is for some of them, but still they smile. And still they show love, because God is in this. But now God calls us to something more. Oh, as a church, who knows what God will will make of the ark? I don't know. But he does. And we'll keep doing it until there's no more need, until God says, you can stop now. It may be a while. But what about you? What about me? I don't just mean the ark. What is God saying to you that you should do? What are the things that God puts on your heart that you think, oh, this should be happening and that should be happening? You know what, when God does that, what he's really saying is, um, what are you going to do about it? It was terrifying beginning the ark. I wasn't really doing anything. I was just sitting there and smiling and said, yeah, you can do that. Sometimes it's terrifying doing what God wants us to do. But he loves you and he loves the people out there and he loves those who come through the doors and those who haven't yet come through the doors. He loves the people who think they're okay. He loves the people who know they're not. He loves the people whose lives are in complete and utter chaos and those who are just about holding it together. Be encouraged. Be encouraged by what God is doing. Be encouraged in whatever you're doing for him, whether it's official as part of the church or whether it's not official. Sometimes all it takes is a smile and a kind word and two minutes of your precious time and someone goes away thinking to themselves, someone cares about me. That is huge. My prayer is that God will build his kingdom in this place. Oh, some people will come here to church and and, and that's brilliant. Um, That's absolutely brilliant. Some people will find him here in this building and that's, that's brilliant. But my prayer isn't that God will make this church bigger or better, but that God will grow his kingdom in this place. My prayer is that people will go home with bread. There's always bread. Um with bread and vegetables and tins and and a cooked meal. And when they do, and they sit there, maybe with their children or maybe with their husband or their wife or whoever it is, and will know that God loves them. Maybe too afraid to come to church on a Sunday because they think perhaps we wouldn't like them because they've had that kind of experience before. Maybe they'll pick up their courage in both hands and come. But you can be part of that. Share the love of God with those you meet. I know some of you you are, and some of you do, and that no one else knows about it. (laughs) May the Lord bless you for that. But James says, I'll show you by faith by what I do. Ask God what it is. And when he tells you something that absolutely terrifies you, then you know what it is. Because you can only do it through him. Turn to him if you haven't. Turn to him and know him. But put your life in his hands because as he says, even the demons believe that God exists, but they haven't started to follow him. Put your life in his hands. Show your faith by what you do.
Give up on your small ambitions. For God has greater things than you can begin to imagine. Trust him. May he be seen here in Shubriness. As it says, as I've said quite a few times on the board out there, it says, to God be the glory. May it always be his. Because the song that we're about to sing reminds us, it's not me, it's not you, it's not Pam, it's not Dave, it's not Joy, it's not John who's joined us here. Thank you, John, for coming. It's not anyone else here. It is God who is doing this. And we'll give him the glory. Let's sing. gift of grace is Jesus my
Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we tell you that none of what we do and none of what we achieve is because of us, but because of you, because of your love, because of your grace, because of your kindness, because of your mercy. May that love and kindness and grace and mercy be seen in us. And by our deeds, may others see the glory of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please sit. There's tea and coffee in, in a moment, and uh, please do stay for that. And donuts as well. And flowers. There are some flowers that will not keep until Tuesday, but if you take them home and do them, Wonderful things that my wife does with flowers, like chopping the bottom. I'm not giving you advice about that. But if you take them home, yeah. And if you take them home and do things to them, they will last. And there are donuts as well. Um, two other things, one of which I'm always forgetting uh, is the offering a collection. Um, it'll go round um, as we sort of um, remain seated, if that's okay. Um, and... Uh, yeah, someone's going to go and do that. Um, but also to say next week. Next week will be slightly different. Um, it's the first in a new venture. Um, hear me try to big this up. No, it's a first in a new way of doing things. We're, we're having our brigades come, and um, we're going to be doing a new kind of... Um, Service. The main purpose being, as well as the worship of God and learning um, about God, is that we'll actually get a chance to meet with each other, actually to talk to each other, um, you to some of the brigade people and the brigade people to you. It might be a little chaotic, um, but that's okay. Uh, do come. Do learn together. We'll be looking at, well, there's something very important, I think, um, happening next weekend that we're going to be thinking about and concentrating on. Um, there will be cake, which will be cut, not with a sword. I'm not allowed to bring a sword to church, even though the queen did that once, didn't she, uh, uh, for one of her jubilees. But come along, uh, learn about brigades, um, learn about what they've been learning about and uh, have a chance just to, to meet them, to meet some of the older children who actually get involved um, in church, as well as hearing from some of the younger ones, which is brilliant. Um, in case you wondered about what I think of all of that, I think it's excellent. Yeah, it is, Kesia. Well done. Yeah, she, she even speaks on, on, uh, on cue. Let's pray. Father, sorry for my bad memory, and uh, bless you, Lord, for these gifts we've been able to give and all the ones that come in through direct debit and, and all sorts of other ways. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you have blessed the ark. And you've always given us enough, and sometimes it's just seemed a bit more than enough uh, to give to folk. But, Lord, we pray that you use these gifts for your glory. 